Well, thank you uh, for returning for our second session. Uh, the second session today, following our, our panel on causes and what has, has brought us to this day um, in our, our culture and our universities, and particularly in our law schools, is this panel here on effects. Uh, we're focusing primarily here on the ramifications that the shout down cancellation culture can have and has had and will likely have upon uh, law schools and, of course, the ramifications that you can have on the profession uh, as well and, um, and even on the judiciary. So we've assembled a panel here to talk today uh, primarily about that. First of all, we have Elizabeth Bartholet, uh, professor of law emeritus at Harvard Law School. She served until t June 30th of 2021 as the Morris Wasserstein Public Interest Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Child Advocacy Program, which she founded in the fall of 2004. Her specialties include civil rights, uh, law, and family law, specializing in child welfare, adoption, and reproductive technology. Before joining Harvard uh, as faculty, Professor Bartholet was engaged in civil rights and public interest work, first with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and later as founder and director of Legal Action Center, a nonprofit organization in New York City focused on criminal justice and substance abuse issues. She is also the author of many publications on child welfare. Professor Randall Kennedy is Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. He was born in Columbia, South Carolina and attended St. Albans School, Princeton University, Oxford University, and Yale Law School. Served as a law clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals and for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. He is a member of the Bar of the District of Columbia, the Supreme Court of the United States as well, and was awarded the 1998 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for Race, Crime, and the Law. He is a member of the ABA, uh, American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, the American Philosophical Association, and a trustee emeritus of Princeton University. Dr. Keith Whittington is William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. He is the author of Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech, among many other publications on constitutional interpretation, history, and policy. Dr. Whittington is the editor with Neil Devins of Congress and the Constitution and editor with R. Daniel Kellerman and Gregory A. a. Caldera, I hope I said that right, of the Oxford Handbook of Law and Politics. He's been in John M. Olin Foundation Faculty Fellow, American Council of Learned Societies Junior Faculty Fellow, and a visiting scholar at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center, and a visiting professor at the University of Texas School of Law, and is a member of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences. Our moderator today is Jenny Bradley Lichter. Uh, she is currently Deputy General Counsel at the Catholic University of America and Senior Legal Fellow at the Religious Freedom Institute. She previously served in the White House as a Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. Prior to her White House service, Ms. Lichter worked on policy issues and federal judicial, including Supreme Court confirmation efforts in the Office of Legal Policy at the U.S. Department of Justice, and previously served as in-house counsel for the Archdiocese of Washington as an associate at Jones Day. She clerked for Judge David B. Sintel on the D.C. Circuit and for Judge Stephen M. Colleton on the Eighth Circuit in Des Moines. She graduated from the University of Notre Dame and from Harvard Law School, and prior to law school, earned a graduate degree in theology and religious studies from the University of Cambridge. So I'll turn things over to Jenny uh, to conduct the panel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I will start by adding my hearty thanks to those already expressed uh, to the Columbus School of Law and the organizers of this program, which I think is so fascinating and important um, and more timely than ever, as we've talked about already a little bit this morning, coming on the heels of the events of October 7th and the, the massive repercussions on university campuses of, of that event and responses to it. My thanks also to all of you for dedicating your morning to spending with us here. I, I know well how many demands probably everyone here has on your time. Um, thanks for being here for the conversation. We are in for a real treat with this next all-star panel. I think you probably all know that professors Bartholet, Kennedy, and Whittington are all giants in their fields, and they're all tireless advocates for free speech. It's really an honor to facilitate their conversation, and my intention is for you to hear as little from me as possible for the next hour or so 
um, so that we can spend as much time as possible hearing, hearing from these folks. So on the heels of the really interesting and thoughtful conversation that we just uh, participated in about causes, as Professor Harmon said, our task for the next hour or maybe a little more, if the moderators give us a little bit more time, um, is to discuss effects. In other words, what are the corrosive effects of the shrinking space for free speech, free expression in the classroom and elsewhere on campuses? What are the effects on faculty, on students, on campus culture, on the profession, and on our, our national culture more broadly? I do think it's, it's difficult to discuss effects in a vacuum, so my expectation is that the panelists might range a little bit more broadly um, and contextualize their analysis of effects by revisiting causes. Um, and please feel free, panelists, to engage directly with what we just heard earlier this morning, or by anticipating this afternoon's sessions and touching on solutions. After each panelist makes their opening remarks, I have, uh, I'll ask a few questions. I have lots of questions, but I'm going to try and restrain myself because I also want to have time for you all to ask some questions as well. So with that, Professor Barthollet. Um, Thank you, and I'm really honored to be here among a group of people who have extraordinary expertise in the issue of free speech in academia. I don't, but I've lived a long time in academia, and I want to talk today uh, to some degree about my journey from the time I was a student through coming to the faculty at Harvard Law School and being on it for several decades. Um, I want to talk about some of the changes that I've experienced from early times till now. And I have to say, I think it's largely a, a, a downward trajectory, I will describe, a depressing trajectory um, in terms of at least the last, the last decade. I want to talk a bit about my concerns and very briefly at the end, touch on solutions. So my journey, I um, came to Harvard Law School and before that to Radcliffe College in the 60s, uh, early 60s. And I came with the idea that I would learn, particularly at law school, I came with the idea that I would learn something that would able, enable me to go out into the world and do something useful. Um, I had vague ideas and they became more specific about doing civil rights and public interest work. And in fact, I got out of the law school a, a good background to do that kind of work, which is what I went on to do for my career before teaching. I also got a thrilling exposure to ideas. Um, I took Eric Erickson for the human life cycle. Eric Erickson wrote the human life cycle. Um, was, uh, he, there were many mind-blowing professors like him that I had the experience of taking. There were also extraordinary and controversial speakers during my time at college and law school. For example, uh, two of the ultimate racist Southern governors, uh, George Wallace and Ross Barnett, and Fidel Castro, uh, who took over the entire Harvard football stadium and spoke one evening. Um, at the time, they were all deeply unpopular, probably Barnett and Wallace more unpopular than Castro, but I remember Castro starting and the audience in this huge stadium was significantly hostile and jeering. And we listened and we learned. We protested some, there were definitely um, protesting sounds that I remember particularly um, in the Harvard Stadium, but I'm sure there were for, for Wallace and Barnett. My memory is often that not good, going back that far. But, but they were extremely interesting experiences. Um, I came to Harvard Law School and the faculty in 1977, and from the beginning through the end was always something of an activist misfit at the law school. I'd been in practice for 12 years before I came back. But I learned to appreciate on the faculty um, the power of ideas, the power of ideas in writing, which compared well to anything I'd ever done in terms of law reform, class action litigation, and um, the power of ideas in the classroom. I came to appreciate 
the freedom. I'd always had it before in the kind of law I'd done because it had always been caused litigation, but I still came to appreciate in teaching and writing at Harvard Law School, particularly as I got into the child welfare area where my ideas are very controversial, deeply unpopular, often get me labeled racist, classist, totalitarian, et cetera, which I continue to think of myself as a left progressive person and am. Um, but I had the freedom to write what I wanted, think what I wanted, teach what I wanted, um, and never questioned that. So I think there have been dramatic changes in the last decade or so, despite the fact that we heard in the earlier panel, and I'm sure it's right, that there have always been problems. But in my experience, there have been dramatic changes in the last decade or so from that experience of freedom to think and express. So I want to talk um, about two things primarily and contrast something from today's world with the early days. So the two things I want to talk about briefly are the new focus on protecting students against hurt, of emphasizing the, how much we want them to feel safe, to feel comfortable, not to be uh, made uncomfortable by ideas, as against thinking about training them, educating them to go out in the world and fight so that other people don't get hurt, which is what I went to law school for and what I tried to teach law students about. Um, and I want to talk about the suppression of ideas and speech in today's world for students as well as for faculty people. So in terms of the current world, I'll just cite two examples. One is the, the one I think is you're all familiar with, the Stanford Law School students who were protesting the conservative judge who expressed views they profoundly disagreed with, and many of us might disagree with, on same-sex marriage and other LGBT issues. Um, when I watched the video of the diversity and equity the DEI dean speaking to the students, some nine minute or so prepared speech, it enraged me. And it enraged me because not just that she was you know, participating in denying to the speaker the right to speak, but it was this comforting of these Stanford Law students, protecting them against the hurt and the discomfort they might feel from hearing ideas that they disagreed with. Um, example two from the current day, one of the courses I taught, we used to send students for a month out into the world to do fantastic, wonderful work, helping to change the world, come back to our, our course and reflect on and continue to do research related to it. So one of our students, um, we were gonna send down to work with Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative, a month where this student would work with death row inmates and prisoners suffering the worst racism, discrimination, and injustice that goes on, well, among the worst that goes on in this world. Um, and he was thrilled to get this assignment. <laughs> but he came to us at the end of the fall term, before the, the, the winter spring started when he would have this wonderful opportunity to say that he wanted to withdraw from the class and make sure that it wasn't on his record so that we would give him permission to withdraw without it showing up on his record because he was so traumatized by the experience of fighting racism at Harvard <coughs> Law School. So I'm against racism at Harvard Law School. I think there was something to fight. It had to do at the time with, largely with the crest of this slaveholder and his family that burned slaves in rebellions. And, you know, good reason to, for black students not to want to be at a law school with that crest as representing Harvard Law School. But I was profoundly disappointed, upset, angry at the idea that he would call himself so traumatized by fighting racism at Harvard Law School 
that he didn't feel able to go down and help death row inmates in Alabama. Um, so those are two current day examples, and then I'll just talk briefly about um, earlier examples that came to mind um, as I thought about, particularly about the Stanford Law School. Well, maybe about both of these examples. Um, so I went to Harvard Law School as a student, 62 to 1962 to 65. It was an era of what might one might call intense, vicious sexism at Harvard Law School. We didn't exactly think of it that way because the world was much worse in terms of denying women opportunity. Harvard let us in. Harvard gave us our grades. Harvard let us earn onto the you know through grades onto the Harvard Law Review, um, but. I had two classes in which every question I got from the professor was a hypothetical in terms of knitting or sewing, at which the entire class would laugh. And you know, there were other things that went on, famous things that you know about Dean Griswold welcoming the women with a dinner at which he asked us to justify taking the place of a man at Harvard Law School. There was lots. Um, and maybe it's shameful that we didn't really fight it at the time, but we went out and did something with this amazing credential that Harvard gave us. Uh, and looking back, yeah, I think maybe we should have done more to fight that. But I think it was more important to get trained and to get a credential to go out into the world and to try to do something. Um, suppression of ideas and speech. So here. I'm not going to talk. There's so many endless examples that have outraged me and probably most of you as I've read the papers um, and seen things that have gone on at Harvard Law School in the last couple of years. So I won't talk about them um, specifically. I do want to say in connection with the, the question somebody raised from the audience about tenure, I do want to say that I think tenure matters. Um, I was once accused of, um, when I was on the Harvard Law School faculty by a student of racism that triggered an investigation at Harvard and a two-hour hearing because I had talked to my students about the social science on transracial adoption and the impact on children adopted, the sum total of what I was accused of racism for. Um, and I was really glad I had tenure when that accusation came in. And it was still a bit scary, but it wasn't nearly as scary as it would have been without tenure. But I have been shocked to see what's gone on at Harvard and at other institutions in the country in the last decade, I suppose, roughly speaking. People with tenure, I'm particularly aware of what's gone on in the area of sexual harassment, where people are accused. Often, I think, without that much, if anything, serious having gone on and near total absence of any process for the people accused, I've been really concerned with that. And so I have been stunned at how those cases of tenured faculty people so accused have been treated at Harvard and elsewhere. The typical way tenured people get treated at Harvard is the administration appoints an outside law firm they have chosen, which does an investigation, produces a report. The administration makes a disciplinary decision, which may not eliminate tenure, but is staggering. So one example, Roland Fryer, an African-American professor at, Har at Harvard University in economics, absolutely brilliant, did fantastic work on race and poverty. I had him to my class a couple of times and was honored he would come. Amazing man with an amazing lab that was doing this race and poverty work. He was accused of sexual harassment. The evidence, as best I saw anything surface, showed nothing more than some raunchy sex jokes late at night and maybe one flirtatious email. Flirtatious, nothing more. Um, 
Harvard did its outside invest. He had tenure, of course, got one of the earliest tenured ever, I think, at, in the economics at Harvard. Um, outside investigation by a law firm. The administration then suspended him from teaching for two years, told him he could never teach a large, he could never teach a small class again, eliminated his lab, which was his work. And uh, when he came back, he could only teach large classes and it would be with a monitor in the room to make sure that he wasn't presumably sexually abusing the students. Um, so uh, anyway, 10 years better than nothing, but it's not a lot of protection in the modern academic world. So um, I'll be really quick and I only have a little to go. So I just want to say that I've experienced in my own teaching, um, a real change. So I've always taught employment discrimination that included sexual harassment. There were years when you could teach sexual harassment and have a discussion of issues in the classroom, men and women. The last time I taught it, which was now probably three, four years ago, um, I decided in advance, call me coward, I'm not as brave as Randy, he's very, very courageous, but I, it just didn't seem worth it. I'd been fighting the sexual harassment due process battles at Harvard, I was totally invested in the topic. It would have been really interesting, but it just wasn't worth it. Why go there? So I'll just teach the law. I tried to teach just the law, and you know, one comment from one student saying, basically, well, there shouldn't be any unwelcomeness requirement, which would mean basically, you, it would be pretty dangerous to make any form of romantic advance in either workplace or academia. So I said, anybody think maybe there's a reason there should be an unwelcome re requirement? Dead silence. Look around the room, male and female students, dead silence. I went back and talked to two women colleagues afterwards, both of whom had taught sexual harassment, they said, absolutely typical, they weren't surprised at all, never any discussion anymore, because it's too scary. It's too scary for students to speak up because their fear of what they'll be accused of, sex is pig, you know, anonymously often, and I, it's just not worth it, so no discussion. Um, I felt to the end I could teach in the area of child welfare even though, you know, since I believe in adoption and I believe in protecting children against abuse and neglect and I, the policies I recommend have a racially disproportionate impact, um, I definitely felt conscious of the need to alert students ever more carefully of how unpopular my ideas were, uphill battle, da, da. Um, but I did it, and I found increasingly a line of students after class, of students saying to me, I don't know why everybody disagrees with you, because everybody, almost everybody who would speak up in class would be disagreeing with me, because, um, you know, what you're saying seems to make a lot of sense. When I taught my last term teaching was on Zoom, and there was there were some pluses um, because of the pandemic, and that wasn't the plus, but the, <laughs> there were some pluses to teaching on, on Zoom because I discovered the anonymous survey. And when I used the anonymous survey for the first time, I discovered that on questions where in class you would think 10% of the class might think that, you know, the kids should be removed from this household where they were being beaten up, etc. Uh, on the anonymous survey, it would be 90%. And I realized the power of that as a teaching tool. And had I continued to teach, I, I would have done a lot more of that and figured out the way, techie ways to do it in class. Um, but I have often said to people, I retired spring of 2021, I think maybe just in time. I think given that child welfare issues are what I've been invested in most, care about most, it was already dangerous to talk about those issues in a classroom the way I did. And I mean, worth it and what would happen and if you have tenure, maybe you're protected. But I think things have really, really changed in terms of the freedom people feel to talk in the classroom. So my final comment just has to do with today's moment on Israel Gaza. So I think that it's a really interesting moment. And again, kudos to this 
group who organized this who didn't know exactly, but uh, they managed to have this at this moment in time. So I have felt, as I've looked around for the last months, that academia has failed in a massive way and in a way that relates to the developments over the last decade in particular. It's really failed. And I think I'll just mention two ways in which it's really failed. One is it's failed to actually protect students against actual physical and other serious hurt. And two, it's failed almost entirely throughout the nation, academia, has failed to structure substantive discussions of the burning issue of this moment of our time. There was a really powerful op-ed written by a student at the Kennedy School about a week ago in the Boston Globe saying she's looking for education about Israel, Palestine, the background. She doesn't know that much what she thinks, and she hasn't found a single offering any place at Harvard University. So the final words in terms of the future, where we might go for here, from here, I have three C's, courage, conviction, and control. I think academic leaders need to develop courage. They need to act on conviction, not just pressure from students and donors. And they need, and this will make me sound like a really cranky old person, I think they need to take control of the classroom and the podium and be back in a position where they would dare to structure a substantive discussion on Israel-Gaza. Thank you. I'd like to thank all who participated in making this occasion possible for all of us, and I'd like to thank those especially who uh, have invited me. I'm going to spend um, a few moments talking about a particular controversy that has emerged at uh, American law schools over the past few years. And I'll start with just a couple of examples. So example number one, uh, and these are all, these, these, are, these are not hypotheticals, these are, these are real cases. Case number one, a uh, teacher uh, in a torts class is seeking to emphasize um, racism in American life and in seeking to really bring home the power of racism, the pervasiveness of racism at a particular time uh, that gave rise to a particular case, the teacher um, uh, actually suggests that um, the record, in the record of the case, the transcript says Negro, and the teacher says, well, that's the transcript, but it was probably the case that the person actually said nigger, just, you know, just given the circumstances. Now, again, mind you, the teacher's point was to emphasize and obviously to criticize the presence of racism in American life. It was in that context that the teacher used the, mentioned, I should say, mentioned, uttered the infamous N-word. Well, the teacher was reported and the teacher, by the way, tenured teacher, was, um, there was a big investigation. For two years, the teacher was kept out of the campus, could not teach, um, has now 
been brought back, but for two years was kept out. Let me give another example. Univer this, is, this is an example. Teachers giving a final exam, the course is a course on employment discrimination. And in the context of a final exam, the, one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the questions is, how would, how would you respond if it came to light that uh, a supervisor had used certain language and in designating the language the, in the, on the exam, the teacher had B, asterisk, 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 and then in, per, in a parenthetical said, this is often used as a derogatory term for women. And then in asterisk, 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 this is a term that is often used in a derogatory way to describe African Americans. A student sitting for the exam uh, complained to the dean of the law school saying that reading this had traumatized the student, made the student unable to respond. This teacher was um, again uh, excluded from class um, and was investigated, was denounced by the uh, uh, dean of the law school and was punished in various ways. Let me mention a third example. Third example involves a, a well-known, very distinguished uh, scholar, former federal appellate judge, who in a course about the founding of the United States was trying to make the point about racism being a very central uh, concern in the founding of the United States. And to try to bring home this point, this professor read something that Patrick Henry was alleged to have said. And Patrick Henry was alleged to have, one of Patrick, Patrick Henry was alleged to have said, listen, this is, a, this is a characterization. Listen, uh, we want to really limit the power of the federal government. We really want to limit the power of the federal government because we don't want the federal government to take away our, and then he said, and this was a direct quote, our niggers. A student reported this professor to the dean. The dean wrote a letter basically denouncing the, 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 the professor. There was an open letter from many members of the faculty. Nothing happened to this professor insofar as punishment other than uh, there was a, you know, a, a, a tremendous outcry. But um, there were certain knock-on effects. So this professor had a a law review article that had been accepted by a, a law review. And when this issue bubbled up, when this controversy you know, became public, the law review uh, declined to publish this professor's article on the grounds that to do so would be to essentially give aid and comfort to such an awful person. Now, I just gave three examples. Let me give one other item to try to bring home that this issue uh, is in the law review world, or in the law faculty world, uh, an important issue. I'm going to read you a statement from the University of California Davis Law Review. This is a statement that was written by the editors of the University of California Law Review and that was signed 
by many of the student editors. Quote, the undersigned editors and members of the University of California Davis Law Review condemn the use of racial epithets in any setting. The N-word is rooted in degradation, in degradation dehumanization, and anti-black racism and has no place in academia or the legal profession. Although one might Although one may have a legal right to use the N-word in the classroom, the N-word does not belong in the classroom. The N-word should never be written unredacted. And it goes on. Now, what is one to say uh, about this? <coughs> Let me just state what my view is. My view is that this word has a long history behind it, and um, it, is, it has been used in an absolutely awful way. The infamous N-word, the word nigger, has been used over and over thousands of times has been the backdrop to terrible atrocities in American life, lynchings, arson. It would be hard to exaggerate the awful way in which this term has been used, and everybody should know that. And that's terrible. That's a, people should know about that, should deeply appreciate that. Um, they should also know that this word, because it is such an important word in the American lexicon, it would be very, um, it should be of no surprise that this word figures very importantly in American law. So 20 years ago, I wrote a book about this word. <laughs> name of the book, Nigger, The Strange Career of a Troublesome Word. And actually, the thing that prompted me to write a little book about this word is I, I went to LexisNexis, and I put in the instructions, N-I-G-G-E-R, and I put in instructions for the computer to spit out the citation. In any case, in which this word appeared. I got thousands of cases, thousands. And when I got thousands of federal cases, then I said, OK, what about the states? Even more. If you just think about it, if you think about arson, if you think about kidnapping, if you think about murder, nowadays, employment discrimination, intentional infliction of emotional distress. I mean, this word is all over the legal system. If one thinks about probably the most infamous murder case of the 20th century, the O.J. Simpson case, you recall that this word figured very importantly in that case in all sorts of different ways. So this is a case that, this is a word that appears over and over and over. And judges, actually, if you mean, it's, it's, it's a live issue. Some judges do what the editors of the University of California Davis want. They redact the word. Some judges say in word. Some judges have in with asterisks. Some judges print the whole word out. And the judges will drop a footnote, and they will talk about the issue. My point is that for a person interested in American legal culture, this is a real issue. And it seems to me it should be a real issue that should be talked about. And from my perspective, it's hard to talk about this without talking about it <laughs> and um, without 
discussing the full gamut of possible responses. I have friends whom I deeply respect who will not, under any circumstances, spell out or utter this word. I, you know, I, fine, we have, we have discussions about it. That's the position that they take. It seems to me that there is a strong argument behind that position. A very strong argument behind that position. I think that people should appreciate that, should think about it, and if they are persuaded by that, they should follow that way. Fine. Um, I also think, however, that there is a different view. I take a different view. You've already seen, you've already heard me speak. You've already, I've already mentioned, uttered the infamous N-word because I think there is some use, actually, in hearing it. Now, I've been engaged in debates about this. With, I, I'll just say just one thing for why, I've already indicated why I think that this is an important subject. I've indicated why I think it's useful for people to have a sense of, you know, a full sense of the way in which people deal with this. One thing that I've had to confront um, on the part of, you know, people who, who don't like my approach, that is to say, who don't like the uttering of the term. They said, listen, this is, you know, this really does singe people's emotions. It really makes people feel badly. There are students that say that they are traumatized upon hearing the term. In light of that, Professor Kennedy, what do you say? And I must say, it, it poses something of a dilemma because one does want to be courteous. One does want to be attentive to the feelings of other people. One does want to be civil. So what does one say? Now, one of the things I have said, and actually it really angers people, it really angers people, is I say, you know, I think that we ought to be attentive to emotions, but we ought not be too intimidated by people's emotions. In the sense that, and the reason why I say that is because um, emotions are like other aspects of human personality. They, they don't, they're, they're not sort of set in stone. We help generate emotions. And it seems to me that if someone says, for instance, that they feel badly, I don't, I don't, um, I'm willing to take at face value their statement that they feel badly. I also think, however, that in an institution of higher education, particularly a law school, question, ought you feel badly? Ought you feel badly? I don't think that that question should be off the table. You feel a certain way. Maybe the way you feel is bad. Maybe the way you feel is dysfunctional. Maybe the way you feel will put limits on what you're able to do. So if a student tells me that they are traumatized by hearing this word, I want to say back to the student, well, hold it. You told me a little, uh, an hour ago that you want to use your legal education to help change the world. You want to be a warrior 
for social justice. You cannot be a warrior for social justice if you are so traumatized by hearing this term that you can't function. I mean, frankly, there is a trauma, frankly, every minute. You just might not know about it. You might not know about it. But around the world, there are terrible things happening right now, as I speak. How does one function in a world that is drenched in tragedy, drenched in misery, drenched in trauma? How should you deal with that? seems to me, you know, maybe we think, about, maybe we talk about trying to change our emotions, change the way we respond to things which we might feel to be very troubling. seems to me in a law school, that is certainly one thing that at least needs to be on the table. Now, two final points. One, again, I don't want to be a know-it-all. There are people who respond very differently. I have in mind, for instance, a person I have just tremendous respect for. Tremendous respect. And I'll mention his name. Jeffrey Stone. Jeffrey Stone at the University of Chicago Law School, as far as I'm concerned, one of the, you know, just, he's an esteemed member of legal academia and deserves it. Great person. Jeffrey Stone taught a class for many years on First Amendment. Just a basic, uh, just a basic course on the First Amendment. And at the point in the course that talked about the subject of fighting words, he would utter the N-word and ask people, you know, ask to challenge the students, you know, how do you feel? Might this be a word that would provoke violence? Well, he did this, and for a number of years, students really complained about it. Said, you know, I really wish you wouldn't use this word. A few years ago, some students came to him after class, complained about it. He talked with them for a long time, and decided to change his practice. He does not utter the N-word anymore. Again, I have tremendous respect for him, and it seems to me that's a, a reasonable position to take. We have all sorts of contexts in which we use euphemism. That seems to me a perfectly sensible thing to do. And that's one way that one can go. I've thought about that. I've thought about, I've thought about that. And there was a point at which I was thinking about changing my own practice. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. And one reason why I'm not has to do with the preparation I made for this panel. One of the pieces that was written in response to things I've written over the years, one of the best crit criticisms I've come across of things I've written on this subject was written by a professor at Stanford, Richard Thompson Ford. He wrote a piece called Racial Epithets and Racial Etiquette. And in the piece, which is critical of, of my position, he said two things. I'm going to read you what he said, and I'm going, to talk, I'm going to end my remarks by talking about my reaction to what he said. He said, he, quote, when students complain about the use of racial epithets, they are attempting to establish a social norm, relatively new in American society, that racially offensive terms are unacceptable and those who use them should not enjoy esteem, respect, and positions of authority and preeminence. Okay? And then, 
page or two later, he comes back to this theme and says the following. Students of color objecting to racial epithets are not defending hidebound customs, and they are not complacent and self-satisfied. Quite the opposite. They are typically socially insecure, finding their way in institutions that only recently allowed people like them a modicum of dignity. That is why they are especially sensitive to insults and slights and eager, even desperate, to establish and defend norms of mutual respect. I think that there is a lot in both of those statements. I think that there's a lot of truth in both of those statements. I think that both of those statements are very powerful. I think that he's leaving out something, however. And I think what he's leaving out is a certain bit of realism about folks who want to ban my practice, folks who want to erase the infamous N-word from its 214 uh, uh, instances of use in the novel Huckleberry Finn, the people who want to eradicate this term from American life. I think that there are some who are animated by the sort of sentiments that Professor Ford mentioned. I think he's being too generous, however. I think that one thing that he's overlooking is the question of power. Even people who, in some contexts, lack power in other contexts, have power. I think that some of these instances, I mentioned the three at the very beginning. So here we have a situation in which students come to a class. We're not talking about an instance in which you're on a bus ride and some stranger says something, or you're in the mall and some stranger says something. No. We're talking about a situation in which there's a class. People have been talking with one another. There's a subject. You're a student. This is a teacher. There's a relationship. The teacher does something with which you disagree. You complain about it. The student, the, the teacher in many of these cases apologizes. In all of the cases that I've mentioned, that won't do. No. No. We want the teacher to be dismissed. We want the teacher to be disgraced. We want the teacher to be punished. There is, in these instances, as far as I'm concerned, a real showing of cruelty, a real showing of overreaching, a real showing of the sorts of things that always accompany the exercise of power. And in these discussions about what should and should not be allowed in the classroom, I think it really does require more realism. And one thing that re more realism would indicate is that in these discussions, in these controversies, actually, students do have power. Students have power. And that is to be taken on board. We need to be more attentive to the way in which people act when they have power. Students have power. Administrators have power. The fact of the matter is virtually all people have power. A minute ago, we, the, the, my, my colleague adverted to events in the Middle East. 
I'm going to end with picking up on that. What do we see in the Middle East? We see people who have been treated horribly over a long span of time turning around and treating other people horribly. I think that we cannot be sentimental about victims. People who are victims victimize. And I think we have to be very attentive to that. And being attentive to that requires realism. Thank you very much. Okay, someone tried very hard to be efficient. Um, so, um, Thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed very much uh, the conversation so far. I've uh, really been able to put together uh, a terrific group um, of people to uh, be on the panel over the course of the day, and, and um, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Um, I've been uh, very focused on academic freedom issues um, over the last uh, few years. Uh, one of the hats I've been wearing is I was the founding chair of the Academic Freedom Alliance, one of the organizations sponsoring this. It's a group of faculty um, focused on defending uh, academic freedom issues in American uh, universities. Um, and uh, that work has been um, eye-opening um, as to uh, what the challenges are that we're facing uh, within American universities. I thought I had a good feel for it uh, when I started uh, uh, working with that organization and when we launched. Um, uh, but I've come to appreciate um, uh, since I've uh, been doing it uh, even more uh, the kinds of challenges uh, that we face um, out there. And in part because uh, I discovered that there's a tremendous number of cases um, below the waterline, um, which FIRE certainly has encountered as well in its work as well. And so it's easy, uh, relatively easy if you're paying attention, to be aware of the kinds of cases um, that get a lot of public attention. Uh, they appear in the media, they're talked about uh, more broadly. Um, what uh, is hard to get a handle on um, is just how many cases of faculty uh, getting in trouble for something that they've said uh, they never uh, get media attention at all. Uh, often faculty are desperate to prevent it from ever getting media attention at all. Uh, they would like to see those controversies go away as quickly and quietly as possible because they think that will impose the least professional damage um, on them. And as a consequence, uh, we often have uh, faculty reach out to us for help uh, because they're mired in some kind of university disciplinary process um, in which uh, they um, uh, want assistance to get um, through that process um, but no one's ever heard of the uh, controversy uh, that they're encountering, um, and they would like to keep it that way um, as much as possible, uh, which poses certainly some challenges as to how best um, to help them out um, under those circumstances, but also highlights, um, uh, for me at least, um, just how many cases there really are out there, uh, what the tools are universities use to try to silence uh, faculty, um, and how um, uh, problematic um, our situation um, has become. Um, I wonder, I'm not confident that it will be true, um, if our current moment uh, will prove to be something of an inflection point um, as we think about um, speech and uh, academic freedom um, on college campuses. Um, I at least find it hard to imagine uh, that after what we've seen over the last month, we're gonna go back to um, having universities uh, attempt to discipline people um, and challenge people over what their choices of Halloween costumes are um, or what kind of language they use um, to refer uh, to uh, certain events uh, in the world. Um, but nonetheless, I'm confident that people will try uh, to take us back to those moments. They will try to sweep under the rug uh, what universities have done over the past month. I hope that some of the coalition of supporters um, that help uh, prop up those institutions um, are now going to be uh, less willing uh, to prop up uh, those censorious institutions, uh, but we'll see. Um, the Academic Freedom Alliance just this morning released a statement um, trying to uh, provide guidance to universities as to how to navigate uh, some of these uh, current controversies and how to relate um, to um, uh, academics uh, in particular. Um, all of this certainly affects uh, student speech and campus groups um, as well. Uh, but our focus has been particularly um, on faculty um, and what kind of challenges uh, there are with faculty um, in the current uh, moment. Um, 
part of what we want to emphasize is that the enduring principles of academic freedom that we've tried to carve out in American universities over the last century um, uh, are important to maintain even in these current moments, in these moments of most heated passion. Um, it's essential to remember what universities are for um, and try to live up uh, to those principles um, as best as we can. So let me just say a bit about um, how academic freedom principles um, are characterized in the United States um, and what some of the challenges are uh, confronting them. So academic freedom emerged in the United States mostly through the efforts of the American Association of University Professors um, in the early part um, of the 20th century, um, and mostly developed a set of uh, commitments um, that they eventually were able to persuade universities um, to largely adopt um, and build into uh, contracts uh, with the faculty. Um, that is designed primarily to protect faculty uh, from their employers. Um, so the target of what, who you're trying to shield yourself from uh, with academic freedom principles as they've been articulated in the United States um, is quite limited. Um, and that has some consequences as to how academic freedom principles um, actually wind up playing out in practice, um, in part because I don't think we um, are sufficiently sensitive uh, to the range of threats that can occur uh, relative to academic freedom uh, currently in the United States, and also how complicated academic uh, professional lives um, actually are. Um, so one bucket of protections that the academic freedom principles that are adopted in the United States emphasize is the freedom of faculty to engage in research uh, without fear from retaliation or censorship uh, from their university uh, employers. And generally speaking, this is an area in which uh, universities have actually been pretty good um, in not uh, restricting um, or suppressing um, academic uh, research in any very direct um, form. But what we also see, though, are lots of instances um, of other university faculty attempting to suppress uh, research and chill scholarly activities. Um, so what we frequently see now um, are people being um, blacklisted from attending scholarly conferences, having their articles withdrawn, um, having pressure put on them not to engage in their research, and occasionally, sometimes for universities as well, um, to do things like restrict people's access to their labs, um, in ways that have um, serious consequences for their ability to conduct their research uh, but without the intended stated uh, goal uh, necessarily of suppressing and censoring uh, their research. So I think there's lots of challenges to free inquiry um, in our scholarly activities um, in the United States, um, but unfortunately um, a lot of those challenges um, are coming from inside the house. Uh, they're coming from other faculty um, and not just uh, from universities and not just uh, from outsiders. The second bucket of traditional academic freedom principle uh, protections in the United States uh, regards teaching, in which the core focus is the ability to talk about controversial materials and bring controversial ideas um, into the classroom in ways that are germane to the subject matter in which you're teaching them. So you can't introduce irrelevant controversial ideas. You can't take students on a journey uh, through controversial ideas that have nothing to do with the subject matter of the course you're supposed to be teaching. But to the extent that you're teaching a course um, that involves uh, controversial ideas, um, the faculty have the freedom to introduce their students uh, to those ideas and discuss them uh, without fear of university uh, retaliation. Um, this is under very serious threat um, in the United States and has been for many years now. Um, and this is also um, the space where we often uh, don't see those threats very easily uh, from the outside. They're not very transparent, in part because the kinds of challenges to what people are doing in the classroom are generally brought by students. So the people who see what's happening in the classroom, translation is, of course, not very transparent in of themselves. Students see what's in the classroom. Students are disturbed or offended by something that's happened in the classroom. And students now know how to go to university administrators who exist precisely in order to punish faculty for things that they say um, in the classroom. And so as a consequence, we see mechanisms of university bureaucracies being leveraged routinely by students in order to um, punish faculty for controversial things they might have done and sometimes this very much might have done um, in the classroom. So in our case, for example, we've dealt with a faculty member who during the pandemic era in which classes were mostly remote and on Zoom also have to be the instance in which his classes are being fully recorded um, by Zoom. Nonetheless, students complained about a whole range of accusations about things that happened in his classroom. Um, there were a series of over a dozen uh, claims about what uh, kinds of things that happened in the classroom. The university suspended that professor uh, put them under investigation without the hiring outside lawyers in order to do the investigation. And of course, what they were able to do in this case was immediately review the tapes. What actually happened in that classroom? What did the professor actually say? Because we have recordings of it. It turns out none of the things the students accused the faculty member of doing actually occurred in that classroom. They completely misrepresented what the faculty member said. And in that case, he was protected by the fact 
his classroom activities were being recorded. And it was possible to go back and review it from an outside observer's perspective. Most faculty, of course, don't enjoy that particular protection. And so it's, we have an extraordinary number of situations in which students um, are leveraging bureaucracies that are not very sympathetic or even uh, care very much about academic freedom issues, and yet, nonetheless, they're charged with the task of disciplining and patrolling of what professors uh, say in the classroom. The third bucket of concerns that are generally uh, uh, fall within these academic freedom principles as they're characterized in, in the United States um, is understood as uh, faculty being able to speak as citizens. Um, so uh, expressing their own personal political beliefs uh, in public settings in various ways. And this may be um, off campus or on campus. Um, it can take a variety of forms, uh, but especially with the rise of social media, uh, we've seen this um, area of activity become particularly controversial. It's easier for professors to express themselves in public than it ever was before. It's easier for them to reach a much larger audience than it's ever been true uh, before. And as a consequence, it's easier for them to reach very hostile audiences uh, than was ever true before. Uh, it turns out when faculty talk about their politics in public, lots of people uh, don't like their politics, um, and a, they push back. Um, these are much, are much more often fairly visible cases um, that they do get reported in the news, and oftentimes they play out um, in public in various ways, and so they're easier um, to see it happening. Uh, but we're seeing extraordinary threats, um, um, often from off-campus um, actors, uh, trying to put pressure on universities to punish faculty uh, for things um, that they've said um, in public. And this is not a trivial set of concerns, in part because it's often quite uh, closely tied um, to research activities of various sorts. So for example, uh, there's a moral philosopher at uh, the State University of New York at Fredonia um, who uh, often studies a range of controversial issues. Among his uh, scholarly books, though, was a book focusing um, on age of consent and the problems of, and the ethical issues uh, surrounding adults who are attracted uh, to, sexually attracted to minors. Um, Professor um, published that book a few years ago. Um, after he published that book, he was promoted uh, to a distinguished chair uh, in the university. He was made the chair of his department. Um, but uh, just a couple years ago, um, he happened to have occasion to talk about that book um, on a podcast. And when he talked about it on the podcast, suddenly his scholarship became evident uh, to a wider range of people, including a wider range of people on campus itself. Um, he was immediately denounced. Students declared that they felt unsafe. Uh, as a consequence of him uh, being on campus, uh, he was suspended and barred from being on campus. It's now coming up on nearly two years, where the university um, has not taken any steps to actually try to remove, to uh, fire him, but instead just re continue to maintain uh, that he's suspended and can't return from campus. Fire has taken his case uh, to the courts. And interestingly, now the defense that the university has offered to the court system about how the university is made unsafe uh, by his presence. No longer focuses on the students who said they were unsafe, which is why he was originally suspended, but instead of fear, somebody might come to campus and shoot up the campus because he's on campus. The university has no evidence this is true. No one's threatened to do this. They have no document. In fact, they've even said the hate mail we initially got as a consequence of the scandal has completely faded away. We no longer hear from anybody in the public about this, but that's when you have to worry the most. It's the quiet ones that might come to campus and shoot up the campus. And so out of fear of something that they have no evidence for at all and never heard of, they were continue to think he can't come to campus and continue his activities as a scholar and a teacher. Universities are extraordinarily willing to try to shut down controversial speech um, on campus. This is not brand they want. They're not in the ideas business, or at least there are many administrators and university leaders who do not think universities are primarily in the ideas business. They're in the making people content and satisfied business. And that includes students, it also includes outsiders, it includes donors. And it's a very serious challenge as to how we move out of that situation. Thank you. Thank you all for your fantastic comments. I'll ask just one question, um, and then maybe we'll have a few times for question and answer, but you can feel free to wave to me when I need to shut things down for lunch. <clears throat> So I'll bring us back to the, uh, our task to talk about effects, try and kind of tie some threads together here. It seems to me that one of the problems, one of the big problems facing efforts to retain a wide berth for free speech is that many students seem to be just totally unmoved by the standard articulations for why free speech is a good idea, right? And totally unmoved by the standard articulations of the negative effects 
of cancel culture. <clears throat> students, including law students, just seem to think it's not true that it's good for them, personally and professionally, to have to have the experience of sitting with hard ideas um, to hear perspectives and arguments with which they disagree. In the context of law schools, I, I think most of us are here because we think it's obvious that it's good for people training to be attorneys to have the opportunity or to be required to kind of sharpen their analytical and communication skills, right, um, against uh, arguments that they don't agree with. But recent experiences suggest that many law students disagree and that their law schools, as we've heard, are encouraging them <clears throat> in that view rather than challenging them. So uh, my question for the panel is, would any of you like to take a shot at articulating the negative effects of a speech-limiting culture in a way that might land with some of with some of today's students. Um, and I heard over the course of the conversation this morning, maybe a couple couple ideas here and there that we could, threads we could pull on a little bit. Um, we've talked to a few people have mentioned about how free speech kind of enabled the civil rights movement, right? Um, Professor Zimmerman said, you know, our students aren't actually learning. What they're doing in the classroom doesn't constitute learning. I don't know if these students care about that, but, but that's something we could think about. Uh, Professor Whittington, I saw in something you wrote, or I think an interview you gave, about your upcoming move to Yale Law School, uh, where famously there have been no uh, conservative public law scholars for many years. I think you said something like, uh, these students are, you know, are gonna be called on to engage with a largely conservative federal judiciary, and if they never have to talk to a conservative, how are they gonna be ready to be effective advocates in the courts, right? So maybe that's something else we could think about that's particular to law school, that's more pragmatic, right? Maybe that kind of rationale hits if, if the sort of more um, thoughtful rationale is like, oh, it makes you better, you know, it's, it's good for you, it's good for you, it seem to not, not hit the mark. Um, so does anyone want to take that, take that on? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, so I, at one point, um, uh, naively assumed that law schools might be uh, uh, more immune uh, to some of these. Um, kinds of controversies uh, than uh, the undergraduate colleges, in part because of the particular mission um, of law schools and what they do, in part because of the self-selection of the kind of people um, who go into law schools. Um, it's clear that I was quite wrong about that, um, that law schools um, are as vulnerable to this as everybody else, uh, which suggests that some of these concerns about trying to persuade students that engaging in uh, a real debate and hearing multiple sides um, is still going to be a tough sell um, even to some law students. I do think there are very pragmatic concerns simply in trying to think about uh, their ability to be better advocates in the future requires uh, them to be able to engage with the other side um, and listen carefully to what the other side says, really understand those arguments inside and out in order to better um, uh, respond to them. I have to admit that one of the um, core reasons actually why I'm quite committed to free speech concerns myself, but also one of the things I have found uh, to be most persuasive um, uh, to younger people in suggesting uh, why uh, they don't want to build up speech codes and uh, speech policing regimes um, is simply a very pragmatic concern about who gets to uh, make those decisions as to which speech is going to be uh, censored. Um, students, uh, strikingly, seem to have a very hard time imagining uh, that they will ever be on the receiving end um, of the censorship. Um, they have a remarkable uh, trust and authority um, in ways that I never would have anticipated uh, for uh, students and younger people more generally. Um, but they have remarkable confidence in deans, uh, for example, on campuses, um, standing up for the things they care about, um, suppressing the people they want suppressed. Um, Trump administration was very helpful for me, at least, in trying to make those arguments to students and trying to emphasize to them, is it really John Ashcroft that you want to um, uh, provide with this kind of weapon uh, to censor speech? Um, and it is possible, I think, to get students to think a little bit um, about imagining um, who's actually going to be exercising power in these situations. Can they always assume they're going to be the ones uh, uh, exercising that power? And what are the, going to be the consequences of building up these kinds of institutions and rules and then having it turned on them? Um, I think it's important not to assume that the people who make the most noise <laughs> are the majority. So I think there are tons of students, and I've only talked to a tiny sample <laughs> of them, who really want more freedom to speak in the classroom and don't like the fact that it's a fearful, terrorizing environment and it's safe for them to just be quiet. I, and I think that could be a majority. And so I guess I come back to saying, 
the administration ought to function as the grown-ups. They, I think they probably know enough already to be made, maybe not talking as intelligently as you, but about the issues, about why we ought to have a classroom where people can speak, why we ought to be able to bring speakers in to talk about the substance of what's going on in the Middle East now. Um, but, so to me again, it's, it's courage, conviction, control. I think the administration needs to take control to do better at educating students why they ought to want a more open free speech environment, but to do more to ensure that they get it. Do you want to speak to us, Professor Kennedy? No, we're good. All right, questions from the audience? Uh, yes, in the back. Wait, me or that gentleman? In the back, you. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, so, um, I guess this is a dumb ball question right in the body. Uh, so, my understanding is that, and I, and I wouldn't be very clear, as, I wouldn't be very clear, I do agree with essentially a Professor Kennedy's position. I do believe in baptism by fire. Because there's some things you cannot teach without actually having to undergo that so-called traumatizing experience. At the same time, I guess to play devil's advocate, I mean, I think most sympathetic argument on their side is that, like, look, all of us, whether we not like it or not, we tend to view free speech not as absolute. We have different red lines, and to some extent, we view things on a spectrum. For example, what's, what do we think of newsworthiness and all that? And I guess their argument is, can we strike the balance between free speech and ensuring that people have a full understanding of what they're going to need in order to know, at, in order to be a, a good attorney? And can we kind of accommodate like all this, I guess, historical trauma, as they put it, and all these like various other things that might detract from their learning experience? Um, two things. One, we've used the term free speech a lot free speech. Um, I think that a person who writes on these matters, who makes a very strong argument against that terminology is Robert Post at Yale. And the argument that he really pushes, and I think it's a strong argument, is he says, listen, um, we're in university life. We're not at a public park. Uh, you know, in the public park, everybody gets to talk, and in a sense, whatever, you know, everybody's equal. In the university life, not everybody's equal. I mean, professors give out grades. You know, you get an A, you get an F. We're judging people all the time. Uh, I teach contracts. If somebody comes to my class, talking about astronomy, I invite them out. We're talking about contracts here. And I get to determine you know, the curriculum. The, the, the point is that the university is not about just speech willy-nilly. We are about something more specialized than that. We are about training people in a certain way. And to get back to your first question, you know, so I, I would say to students, listen, we're about training people in a certain way. We're given a position of authority because, you know, we have certain knowledge, we have certain experience that presumably um, uh, enables us to train you in the best possible way, or at least the way we think is the best possible way. And it's in that light that to go back to your, you know, I would say to students, listen, um, I actually think it would be a good thing for you to be put off balance sometimes. H how do you react when you're off balance? You know, let, let, let's, 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 that, that's not the worst thing. Let's work at that. If something, if there's certain things that really bother you, Maybe the response is not to run away from those things, but to run toward those things. In any event, to get back to your point about control, it seems to me that educators, you know, we're at the front of the class for a reason. 
and we should have the confidence to articulate that and to act on it. And so if we think that baptism by fire is the best pedagogical approach, pursue that. There are other approaches, and I think that other approaches sometimes are sensible. Um, and if you, know, if you have a teacher that wants to take the other approach, fine. But if you think baptism by fire is the, you know, is the, is the most effective mode of teaching, it seems to me educators should have the confidence to put into you know, action uh, that belief. I hate to, to stop us there. We do have a lunch speaker, though, and uh, to uh, give her plenty of time to do her talk. We'll move towards lunch. Uh, maybe we can entertain more questions during lunch. Thank you for all of our panels and to the other